America Meditating Radio Show, we collect wisdom, inspire each other, and empower hearts 24-7. Hi, I'm Sister Jenna. Join me and guest on Blog Talk Radio as we amplify stories that compel us to be more for ourselves and everyone else around us. In 1987, some first graders were promised a college education. This came from Oral Lee Brown, who saved a large portion of her modest income, sending 19 kids to college, helping others pass it on from the Foundation for a Better Life at Values.com. Are you in need of a tech service company that's going to deliver the best solutions for your business? Then Atronica is your solutions headquarters. Here we specialize in your individual needs to make sure your business shines. For more information, please call 301 301- 417-0070 or visit us at our website at attronica.net at Tronica, where we deliver for you. Get off the grid and step inside your heart. Sister Jenna guides you through a powerful, encouraging, and motivating meditation that allows you to let go and become aware of you. Regain strength, power, and peace. The Meditation Museum in Silver Spring, Maryland offers a variety of courses and activities to make your life go a whole lot smoother. Located at 9525 Georgia Avenue, you will be able to experience the beautiful silence that's in the space. There are courses in Raj Yoga Meditation, Positive Thinking, Stress-Free Living, and Personal Development classes. For more information, call us at 301-588-0144 or visit us online at meditationmuseum.org. Hey, everybody, it's John DuPerrin from Project Forgive. How are you doing? You are in the right place for the highest level of conversation to feed your soul. American Meditating with Sister Jenna. Stay with us. Hey everyone, it's Sister Jenna and welcome to America Meditating, online radio show where you get to learn more about who you are and perhaps the way that life is preparing you in the world. I want to give a big uh, shout out to Jean de Puron, who has really been a very, very big friend of ours and has definitely continued to amplify our work in the world. Well, the political campaign is still quite a conversation, and I know my producer, Antonia, keeps going, Sister Jenna, why are you so caught up in this? I'm caught up in this because I love the world. I love this country. I love destiny. I love the drama. And I've been sort of um, participating and observing some of the conversations and some of the news reports, and I I'm watching it from a detached perspective and yet from a very passionate perspective. So it's a very big balance of the in and the out, sort of. I'm looking at what's going on with our political energy, with the yin and the yang consciousness. I don't want to take sides, but I want to be prepared with what we're going to walk into starting January 21st, 2017. I believe we're all responsible for the condition of the world, not just the voice of one person. One might be the mic that amplifies what we have been thinking and feeling for quite some time. So I'm definitely not pointing fingers on Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders, but they are speaking in ways in which I think it's helping us to hear our own voices if we're really being honest and open enough. And even when I look at the conversation of meditation and spirituality, I'm finding it a huge call at this particular time. And coming up in May, we're launching a new meditation workshop and activity and initiative for the country. And we want all of you to come on board and to participate with us. And for those of you who are really listening to this conversation today, and I usually don't do this because all the people even on my Twitter account, which is only about 500, are people I really know personally. They're my friends. For the exception of about 15 people. I'm beginning to move in the area of saying, let us continue with the story. I've got a lot of things percolating and things that are very well intended and meaningful and I think life-changing for our nation. Please stay tuned. We're going to have Dr. Tara Rodden Robinson on the air, and we're going to be talking about an alchemist of time. She's an executive coach, and she'll be taking us through different conversations and ideas and thoughts that she's been percolating in her life, as well as talking about her new book, which is entitled Sexy Plus Soulful, A Woman's Guide to Productivity. So before I get Tara on the line, let's do a little meditation, which is what we really do well here. And I'm going to invite you to just relax. Keep your eyes opened 
because I advocate open-eyed meditation. So we can look where we're going whilst we're walking and moving around. And meditation is a state of awareness, not just sitting down and saying you're decluttering. But when you're walking and moving around, be in a decluttered state. Breathe in deeply, relax, and from my famous off-the-grid, into-the-heart meditation CD, here's the Letting Go track. Om Shanti. The time that we choose to be aware doesn't necessarily require me to just sit and meditate. But even while I walk and move around, I can be in a meditative awareness, which is awareness of the soul, the original, eternal, imperishable being of light. For a little while, I'd like to invite you to be present, to be here, and to be now. Allow your mind to settle in the moment, to relax. This meditation is about awareness. It's about becoming aware of your original and eternal self. It's about connecting to your truth. Let go of your name. And observe yourself feeling nameless. Let go of your gender to discontinue thinking you're a man or a woman. Let it go and observe how you would feel walking around without a gender. Let go of the role that you play and let go of the titles that you own. Observe how you're feeling as you are gradually letting go. Let go of your religion and put it aside just for now. And let go of your nationality and even the language that you're accustomed to. Imagine you have no name, gender, role, title, religion, nationality, or even a language. Ask yourself. How do you feel at this moment? And in this feeling, who would think of you and who would you think of? Supreme Soul would think of you, and you, the liberated soul, would think of the Supreme. In this state of absolute freedom, I am truly who I am. A free Peaceful, pure, immortal, and 
eternal soul. Allow yourself to just be absorbed in this awareness. At this time, Welcome back. That was Letting Go from Off the Grid into the Heart by yours truly, (laughs) me. Well, the America Meditating Radio is really happy to welcome Tara Rodden Robinson. Tara was 28 years old. She dropped everything to move to Costa Rica, where she fulfilled her dream of living and working in the rainforest. Since then, she earned a Ph.D. in biology, authored Genetics for Dummies, left Academia to become an executive coach, and is now an internationally recognized expert in the field of personal productivity. Her new book is entitled Sexy Plus Soulful, A Woman's Guide to to Productivity. And today, we welcome Tara on the America Meditating Radio. Hi, Tara. Hi, Sister Jenna. Such a joy to be here with you today. Oh, I'm so glad that you could make it. What a feat, just dropping everything and moving to beautiful Costa Rica. I want to do that. (laughs) You know, as you were reading my bio, I kind of got a little emotional because sometimes I look at my journey and think, this occur for me? How did I get the blessing of living this amazing life? You know, in my spiritual community, we have this awareness or just knowledge and it's written but I don't know what's written (laughs) yes exactly and so you know I do everything that I think I'm supposed to be doing I I act like I'm in charge I actually act like I'm making decisions but it's all written and the fact that your destiny wrote this script for you I understand what you're feeling I get that on occasions when I do my life review and I just marvel at how my script could have been written this way well I want to get to some of the things that you're doing especially around productivity through your writings and your courses in art you're empowering women to find time you know for what they're really passionate about now what inspired your interest in becoming definitely an executive coach, but how did you come to be interested in the area of productivity, per se? I turned to productivity because at the time, which was 12, 13 years ago now, my life was just such a mess. I was so overwhelmed and so overloaded, and I felt I felt like a failure, felt like an imposter, even though I think outwardly I appeared quite successful. I was a college professor at the time. I felt like my life controlling me and that my work was controlling me, and I needed a way out. And so I started investigating personal productivity methodology and ended up really becoming an expert, a particular method uh, by another author. And that activity journey also sort of led me through my exit from academia. I became a professional coach and eventually specialized in executive coaching because I have an interest in, and I think a, a strong kinship with people who are achieving at high levels, whether it's in academia or corporate life or whether they're self-employed. I get people who have strong ambition and strong drive to achieve, and that's basically the kinds of people that executive coaches work with. Now, how do you actually become an expert? Is it the years Is it the amount of clients? Is it the feedback that you get? Or is it just, I know that for me, I've reached a place where I tell a lot of my friends and close connections, I got this. And yet I know people who've been on the journey similar to mine, 80, 70 years, I've never heard them say that. But what I mean by saying is that I got this, I know one-on-one will always be two. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm Mm-hmm. Yes. 
I have that same sense of certainty about myself that you're describing, so I relate very strongly to that phrase, I got this. Part of how I got here was through years of practice, the number of hours that I've coached people anymore, but it's many hundreds of hours. I study. I have, my husband claims that I have a photographic memory, and I'm not quite sure that that's true, but I do have an extremely good memory. So when I learn something or I hear story, or some bit of knowledge comes to me that really resonates strongly, I can remember it and remember it in great and exacting detail. So all of those things, I think, come together to help me know that I got this. But I think there's one other part. And for me, it was this journey of doing my work, my own process of reflection of working with a counselor, working with a spiritual director, doing the hard work of knowing myself. I think that was the last piece of the puzzle for me that helped me see, oh, yeah, I got that. And even in saying that I've got this is not even to say that I've closed my door to the learning experience. It's just that I deeply believe you give sorrow, you're going to get sorrow back. You give Mm -hmm. happiness, you're going to get happiness back. It might not be from the person that you're giving it to, but it might be your next-door neighbor who you barely said hi to when they just came and brought you a bouquet of flowers because he just felt like doing that, you know? So I believe in that kind of a level of getting it and still being open to the learning curve. Hey, we want to congratulate you on the release of your new book. You must be excited. What an interesting title, Sexy Plus Soulful, A Woman's Guide to Productivity. (laughs) Tell our listeners a little bit about how did you come up with the title and a little bit about the book. So the way I came up with the title, the word soulful came to me first. Part of that is an acknowledgement of how different my viewpoint is now from how it was five, seven years ago. Activity that I cut my teeth on, so to speak, is very mechanical. It's dry. It's very, I don't want to say soulless. It certainly doesn't have the sense of being very heartfelt. Part of what I was intending to create with Sexy Plus Soulful is a very heartfelt, very feminine, very soul-filled way of bringing our contributions to the world and being productive. And so the word soulful came to me first. The word sexy, I define differently from how many people may think of the word sexy. I use the words confident, bold, and centered to define what sexy means to me and what sexy looks like and feels like. I believe that any person, not just women, men do, if we're confident, we're bold, and we're centered, that creates a presence in the world that is extremely attractive. Presence transcends age, it transcends appearance, it transcends state of life and context. Anyone, but especially women, can inhabit this way of being confident, bold, centered. And I don't recall if it was in the intro or in the meditation where you talked about the eternal soul, the soulful part of this is recognize that we have sacred selves. And I think when we can bring all of that knowledge into one place, it is extremely liberating, extremely empowering, and it sets the stage, bringing our contributions, our gifts, our strengths, our talents, abilities into the world, and that is extremely productive. That it sure is. You say that we're surrounded by male-dominated theories on productivity, and you tend to measure success by what we say we're accomplishing. So for Tara, what is success to you and what is the difference between the male and the female approach to productivity? Is it different? Well, I think it's very different, and I want to answer that first question first. What does success mean to me? We live in a culture that looks at appearance, it looks at status, it looks at material wealth, and uses those as some sort of gauge of success. And I think it's very easy to fall prey to that worldly definition of success. But here's what success looks and feels like to me, being fully present fully engaged, in other words, not distracted, but being attentive, totally there for the person with whom I'm in the room with, being compassionate, putting love first and letting love guide my decisions, residing in that place of enough and understanding that the material good define me. Those are all part of what success looks and feels like to me. I think ultimately 
One of the things that that I've come to to understand very deeply is that we do not control our results. We can do all the right things. We can work very hard. And we may still not get the results that we're attempting to manifest, but we can control our effort. And so if I'm engaged in sincere and devoted effort, if I'm present, if I'm fully engaged, those are all part of what success is because I can't control how my results are going to turn out, but I can control showing up and being the best me I can be. So that's what success looks like to me. I like that. You know, it's it's defined in so many ways. And um, many years ago, I remembered hearing my 100-year-old yogi mentor now. She's still alive. And she said to me, Jan, you'll know that you've succeeded when your happiness is maintained at 95%. And I went, mm-hmm. wow, I get that. I so get that, Daddy. I get that. Soulful. What is it? What is the soul, Tara? When you speak about being soulful, it's such a big language nowadays, and it's no longer just something that people used to wonder, what is she talking about? I mean, everyone's talking about You've got Oprah Winfrey with her Super Soul Sunday. You've got Soul Pancake. You've got just a lot of soul conversation. What is your understanding of soul and soulful? Well, my understanding of soul is that we're more than our body. I really am firmly convinced that there is a part of us that is eternal and divine and that this experience that we're having right now, this human experience, is being had by a spiritual being. And I'm a Catholic, so I'm a Christian, and so I have a theological point of view. Beyond that theological point of view, I'm quite convinced that we are eternal eternal, sacred beings, and that's what the soul is to me. In terms of being soulful, even, and I talk about this in the book because the first third of the book is really largely memoir, I have gone through times when I lost my my faith and even went through a time in which I thought I was an atheist. Even during what now I look back on and seeing a very, very dark time in my life, still felt that the, the life of the spirit, a spiritual life, was needed in order to be a whole human being. And so when I think of soulful, I'm really thinking of that spiritual life that can transcend or go beyond or be set aside from a particular religious or theological point of view. I believe that we can have a sense of the sacred and that we don't necessarily have to have a belief in divine in order to cultivate a sense of the sacred. And that to me is what soulful is. It's it's a heart-centered, I get emotional when I talk about these things, it's a very heart-centered, very love-centric way of being. It is that though, because I think we're getting behind the veils when we talk about it and we're revealing ourselves at a very, very deep level. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you so much. You have written that when we are under the influence of the three destructive myths about time, we tend to prioritize accomplishment over practically everything else, and especially over self-care, our loved ones, rest and play. What do you say are the three destructive myths that you refer to? So the three destructive myths about time, I came to understand these after working with many, many people over uh, close to 10 years of working as a coach. And the first of these myths is I will have more time later. Most of us realize when we say it out loud that it's a myth, that we recognize that two weeks, two years from now, life is going to be just as full as it is now. But we tend to live our lives and make our decisions as if there's going to be more time. There's not more time later. And in fact, later doesn't really exist. We really only have the present moment. That's where we live at every single second. And so if we're going to have enough time, we have to learn how to have enough time now. And so that's part of the book is teaching people how to have enough time in the now. The second of these myths is time is outside my control. It's true that we can't control the ticking of the clock, but what people don't realize that our brains actually manufacture our experiences of time. And a lot of this comes from the work of neuroscience, neuroscientist David Eagleman. And what he's, his research showed was that the amount of detailed information that the brain takes in and writes into memory is what the brain uses as a way of estimating how quickly time is passing. So if we're rushing through life, 
and our minds are not writing down a great deal of detail about the world around us. The brain assumes that time is going by more quickly. Opposite is also true. And so this was such a beautiful experience as I was listening to your guided meditation before we started our conversation. Can more details about the moment around us. So we center ourselves on our breath. We hear the sounds in the environment around. We feel sensation. We see color. As we root ourselves in that very richly textured experience of the present moment, brain is writing all those details down into memory. And that's a cue that our brains use to say, oh, going by more slowly. So we actually have a remarkable amount of perceptual control over our experiences of time. We can't control the clock, but we can control our experiences of our time. And that turns out to be incredibly powerful. And then the third of the three myths is a very counterintuitive one. My time is precious. And we hear people say this all the time. My time is precious. But part of the problem with that is that personal pronoun my. Grasp time as a possession, we tend to become more impatient and more stingy with our time. Paradoxically, if we can let go of that personal pronoun my, and begin to reside in this place of all time is precious, whether it belongs to us or not, whether we're claiming ownership over time or we're letting go. Equanimity. Listeners who are not familiar with this term, although if they're into meditation, surely they will have heard the term equanimity. But equanimity is a balanced state of mind. Equanimity is more resilient to the ups and downs of life. We don't get so hijacked by our reactions or our emotions. Equanimity is a much more calm and serene way of being, regardless of what outside circumstances are like. Part of letting go of this my time is precious, residing in a greater state of equanimity that allows us then to be less impatient, more patient, more generous with our time, more resilient in the face of interruption, more resilient in the face of crises and adversity. All of us are going to experience anyway. Right, I get that. Those are powerful myths. And thank you so much for clarifying them as well. I think our listeners have gotten a boost of nuggets in terms of um, clarity and understanding. Tara, I want to thank you for your compassion and your kindness and fortune of living. And before I let you go, please leave us with a favorite life quote that you're living by. And is there an event or a program that's coming up for you so that you can offer us a website where our listeners can find out more information about you? My favorite's from the book, Giving Oneself Approval. So the quote is, perfectly capable of giving yourself approval, seeing yourself, and what you do with love. And the big event in my world is that the book comes out on Friday, March the 25th, and people can find out more about me on my website, tararobinson.com. Tara, thank you so very much, and congratulations on the release of the book. That must be an exciting time for you, huh? It is wonderful. I am beside myself with joy. (laughs) Oh, that's fantastic. Well, congratulations, and if you're ever in D.C., please come and give us a call or a visit, okay? I would love that. All right, take good care. Thank you. Bye. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. Wonderful conversation with Tara. I think she left us with a lot of things that we can percolate on and actually make our lives a whole lot better. But just thinking about, you know, Living your life soulfully is the time. I don't think it's going to satisfy our soul if we keep playing it safe, or how I usually put it, when you don't do the things you think you cannot do. (laughs) I think it's time for us to really just trust, but have a foundation. Make sure you're practically leading yourself up to your destiny. Don't go jumping off of a bridge, um, say you want to bungee jump and you forgot the cord. You know what I mean? You've got to prepare yourselves. Prepare your stages. You should be feeling it. They come up in thoughts. And these thoughts are guiding you to become soulful and to live your life freely and openly. So check those thoughts. Put them on paper. Make sure they connect. Make sure that they make sense so that you can have a very successful and productive life. Thank you for joining us on the America Meditating Radio. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Dr. Robinson. Remember, no one can take away your happiness unless you give them permission, and we are here to love each other the same. So let us do that. I'm going to end today's conversation with Keep the Faith from Bliss. Take care, everyone.
Keep the faith in love. 